if you are having, especially with gut pathogens, because I think maybe we could at least uh, put it to other enteric pathogens, is that you might want to look at maybe increasing the methionine, the threonine, and the tryptophan content in the diet. And we're talking 20%, right? It, it's not really a lot when you consider some of the other things that are put in diets that you put in just in case that might cost a little bit more. Um, and part of my recommendation for this, and it also re relates back to the, the question that you said we were going to get back to is like, well, if I don't see an effect on performance, why would I put this in? Welcome to SwineNet Canada podcast. My name is John Patience and I'll be the host of today's session. And today uh, we have a very special guest. We actually have another host of SwineNet Canada uh, and none other than Dr. Dan Columbus, who's at the Prairie Swine Center. Uh, Dan, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I guess it was, you know, it's not unusual, but it, it's weirder to be on this side of it, <laughs> for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so Dan, I mean, by now, I'm sure most or not, if not all the people know you fairly well, but maybe just briefly, you have a what I think is a very uh, unique and impressive background, uh, academic background before you join Prairie Swine Center. Maybe you can give us a little bit of that background and then a little bit on your research program at Prairie Swine Center. Yeah, sure. Um, so I started out, I guess I'm originally from Ontario, from a smaller city called Sarnia, which is right on the border with Michigan. So no farm background at all. And, and you know, decided I was going to go to Guelph and I was going to be a vet. And after trying to get into vet school uh, and realizing the error of my ways, I, I, you know, ended up in agriculture and partly because I was trying to get large animal experience and, and eventually worked my way into the swine barn at Guelph and then eventually uh, starting as a research technician for Case DeLang, who I'm sure most people would know um, from Guelph and ended up deciding to get into a master's and then continuing on to a PhD with him, uh, focusing on, I, I did liquid feeding and then I focused on protein nutrition, which has kind of been the, what the rest of my career has, has focused on. Um, after finishing with Guelph, I applied and got the opportunity to go down to the Children's Nutrition Research Center, uh, a USDA facility down at the Texas Medical Center in Houston to work with uh, Dr. Teresa Davis, where we looked at uh, neonatal pigs as a model for human infants. So really delving into the model aspect of working with pigs uh, down in Texas. And then I, I tell people that I got sick of the the really bad heat down in Texas and decided to go to the really bad cold in Saskatoon. <laughs> so yeah, in 2015, I came up and I joined the Prairie Swine Center as the, the research scientist in nutrition. And that's where I've been uh, ever since. And I'm also adjunct on, on campus here at the University of Saskatchewan, so I can have grad students and, and work with uh, many of the people in the, the Western College of Vet Med and Vito and, and in the department there. Um, yeah, so for the, the last eight and a half years, I've kind of delved into a number of different areas, everything from feeding management to mycotoxins and um, oh, what else have we looked at? Yeah, you know, it's kind of a, a mixed bag, but I think that the biggest area of mine has continued, like I said, to be that protein nutrition and specifically amino acid nutrition um, and really looking at amino acid requirements and how the factors that affect those in particular uh, nutrient or, or ingredient composition, whether that be fiber or, or a different ingredient in the diets, um, and mainly looking at the uh, health and how the health status of the animal changes, how they use nutrients and respond, and how we need to adjust the diet to account for that. Yeah, it's um, it, to me, when I look at your program overall, Dan, it really looks like you've got this triangle of uh, nutrition, the pig, and gut health. So, you know, the overall pig as an entity, but then you also focus in on gut health and doing that all through nutrition, which is obviously an increasingly important topic and one that we're going to talk a little bit about today. And we're going to talk about functional nutrients. So maybe to start that off, Dan, what 
in the world is a functional nutrient? So I, I actually think there's a little bit of controversy that's starting to come up when we talk about functional because you'll, you'll hear the argument, especially with amino acids, it's like, well, they all have a function. So how do you, how do you say that this one's functional or not? And I think specifically when, uh, so researchers like myself, um, when we're talking about functional nutrients, it's, we're talking about something that has a function beyond what we would normally be looking at with respect to growth, right? We're so used to um, examining nutrition and aspects, especially in livestock agriculture, from how does this impact the growth of the animal? Um, and when we talk about functional nutrients, it's how does it impact the immune status? How does it impact the gut uh, development or gut status in, in those pigs? How does it uh, affect the reproductive status? You know, it, it's something that goes beyond just protein synthesis in that pig. Right. Yeah. And that uh, you're right. It is somewhat controversial or maybe maybe just not well understood. And I think from a nutritional point of view, Dan, it's a little bit scary to think that there's uh, ingredients that we put into our diets that don't uh, fit neatly into a mathematical equation to predict growth. Right. It's it's sort of extra growth. Uh, function as you've described it. So maybe you can give us a give us a few examples. Yeah. So actually, I was going to say, you know, and and that's one of the things that we've had pushback on is because a lot of times when we're talking about um, adding more of these functional ingredients, you don't get that impact on growth, or you actually get a reduction maybe in in the growth performance of the animals, right? So it's also requiring kind of a different mindset. Um, to how we formulate and how we then even look at the economics of, of doing these diets. Um, I think one of the biggest examples of something that doesn't really fit, we don't, we're still trying to figure out would be even fiber. Um, you know, it was traditionally looked at as an anti-nutrient. You don't want fiber in your diet because it binds other ingredients, it reduces digestibility. But now we're seeing that there's a lot of uh, benefits to having fiber and even in the the wiener pig which we you know we were always told do no fiber in the wiener diet but it actually um, has been shown to have those effects on the gut development and microbiome development which is a big one too in maintaining that barrier function um, and, and there's difference whether you look at soluble and insoluble fiber right so i think that's one of the biggest ones that people might be more familiar with um, when we look at amino acids, a lot of the functional ones that we end up looking at um, tend to be methionine, threonine, uh, tryptophan has been another one. These are, are amino acids that, at, at least in my research, that we focus on because they are known to, have, to be key components of immune uh, system. So whether that's the acute phase proteins, mucin production in the gut with respect to threonine um, or uh, impacting uh, feed intake or other aspects with tryptophan. Um, like, so these are kind of examples of some of the, the, the functional nutrients that we would be looking at um, and kind of maybe even what outcomes you need to focus on in order to see their benefit because you might not see the benefit in growth. Right. Or you might see the benefit in growth under some circumstances, uh, such as a health challenge, and not see it in other circumstances when there is no health challenge or a certain kind of health challenge, etc. So, right, it's, uh, it, it is a challenging subject. So, Dan, let's pursue this a little bit because I think uh, you're right. It's a bit of a con controversial topic or a somewhat misunderstood topic. And you made a very good point that you don't necessarily, in fact, frequently don't see a response in terms of growth. And, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, and just to give you a, a bit of time to think about the question is if I don't <laughs> see a response in growth, why should I care? But we'll come back to that in, in just a minute. I want to delve a little bit more into what are functional in, in, ingredients or functional nutrients and what might they do. And so one that's kind of a very current topic, uh, an important topic in our world is zinc. So if I run a study to determine the, the traditional requirement for zinc in the, in the young pig, I'm going to come up with a, a number that's in the range of what, 80 to 150 parts per million, maybe yep. as high as 200 parts per million, something in that range. Um, but if I put in 3000 parts per million, 
uh, then I'm going to see some real benefit. So is that a nutritional response or is, would that be an example of a functional response? I actually think that that one's a little bit of a different um, uh, kind of nutrient. And, and mm -hmm. the reason I'm saying this, and maybe it'll be controversial, is I think zinc's function to improve the performance uh, in the pig, from my understanding, is from reducing the pathogen load in the gut and might not necessarily have a physiological effect on the pig. So in that situation, I don't necessarily, with my definition of functional nutrients, would say that it is one because it's not impacting something with the animal, right? It's it's increasing performance because now the animal doesn't have to respond to the pathogen load in the gut or you don't have the pathogens having the negative effect on the gut with nutrient uh, okay. absorption in that. I, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, Dan, and, and, and you're – much more familiar with the topic than I am. So I was interested in in your take on that. So you're kind of saying that uh, in your mind, a functional uh, ingredient or a functional nutrient has to uh, uh, affect the animal specifically and directly, uh, whereas something like copper or zinc at, if we call them pharmaceutical levels or extra nutrient levels, is really affecting the the microbiome in some fashion and that's outside the pig, so to speak. Yeah, to me, it would be like if you if you would consider an antibiotic a functional nutrient or not, right? I don't think anybody's really going to look at the antibiotics we put in a diet as being a functional nutrient. It's there to reduce the pathogen load. Right. Very good. Yeah, very good point. Excellent. That's in order to help our audience and help me understand the subject a, a bit better. Then, can you give us some more examples, but dig a little um, uh, or talk a little bit more detail about what some of those, like you mentioned threonine as an yep. example, um, but can you talk about a number of those examples and help us to understand exactly what they're doing? Yeah, so I, I we, we've run a number of studies in my lab to look at these. We started out with threonine and that's why it's always kind of top of my mind and we had this we, first, nobody at the time had looked at whether threonine requirements were greater in an immune-challenged pig, and we also wanted to look at the effects with fiber because we also know that fiber in increases the threonine requirement as well because of mucin production. So our very first study was we looked at um, pigs that were either given a normal or a high-fiber diet, and then we either or we challenged them or left them unchallenged, I should say, or then challenged them with uh, lipopolysaccharide or LPS, which is an immune stimulant. Um, and our hypothesis was that both the threonine and the fiber are going to increase uh, uh, the, uh, or sorry, immune stimulation or fiber are going to increase the threonine requirement. And then if you put both of them together, you're going to have an even greater increase in the threonine requirement. And then when we started looking at the, the results, we found, okay, yep, that's, shown that um, the threonine requirement was greater with fiber, which is kind of known. So we confirmed that. We showed that it was increased with the immune stimulation. So that's great. And then when we looked at the both together, we didn't have a further increase. And we thought, what is going on here, right? That should make any sense. When we delved down deeper, we actually found that the mucin production was greater in the threonine, or sorry, in the, the fiber diet. And when we measured um, gut, uh, gut permeability with a lactulose mannitol gavage, we actually found that that reduced gut permeability in those pigs. So our hypothesis is then that, well, they don't require the extra 3D with the immune stimulation because the gut is already protected um, with the mucin, and that would be the major response variable. Um, We've seen this kind of multiple times where uh, it's kind of been the opposite of what we expected. Um, and so another example, we did uh, a very first study where we're looking at a blend of amino acids. So we gave methionine, threonine, and tryptophan at 120% of NRC requirements. Um, they got that for a week, and then we challenged them with salmonella, and then we followed them for a week after that, um, after the challenge. And again, one of the thoughts was 
when you stimulate the immune system, you have all this extra requirement for supporting the immune response. So the requirement should go up. And when we actually looked at these pigs after the challenge, we found that when we gave the functional amino acids, the immune system was actually less activated than what we would have expected, right? We thought we were going to support it. It was going to be greater, but albumin and haptoglobin went the opposite way that you would expect in a sick pig. We saw this in other aspects too. And again, what we're thinking is by providing these functional amino acids, you're having that effect on the gut barrier uh, and you're re you're reducing the pathogen's ability to even infiltrate into the animal and stimulate a whole body immune response. So that's kind of been some of the, you know, our, our, our interesting findings when it comes to things, uh, you know, that it's kind of been the opposite and where the, the mode of action might be coming from. Okay. Very interesting. Interesting that um, uh, the fact that it, that the uh, permeability of the, gut is altered is is kind of interesting have you looked at any other measures of gut permeability because i know university of saskatchewan is really really well known for ushing chamber research and i wonder <laughs> if you've gone that far in the pig dan we, we haven't been able to do that it's actually very difficult once you've infected a pig with a pathogen it's it's really difficult to take those tissues and test them anywhere else for for stuff so we have looked at mucin production um, we had specifically looked at, um, tight junction proteins and stuff like that, but the data was messy. So I don't want to make any, yeah. uh, conclusions yeah. based on that. Um, but so we're, we're kind of looking more at the secondary kind of responses. So when we measured, uh, and, and why we think that we're resulting in, in less pathogen uptake is that when we looked at the infiltration of lymph nodes and spleen, we get a reduction. Right. When we look at pathogen shedding, we get a reduction with with functional amino acids. And that's the only thing that we can see is that, you know, we're 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 improving the gut environment enough that, you know, it's able to fight that. Very good. OK, so is it too early yet or are you able to make recommendations on uh, for disease challenged pigs? And we probably should defined disease challenge a little <laughs> bit when we say that. Um, but um, what differences should the nutritionists that are listening in, what changes might they consider in their diet formulations when they're dealing with health challenged animals? Yeah, I think the, the caveat that I'm going to put is that these have only been tested in salmonella challenged pigs, so it might not be relevant with other pathogens. Um, or other challenges. I know that other work has been done looking at PERS challenge with functional amino acid supplementation that has not shown necessarily uh, uh, as many benefits as the, as the amino acids that we use. Although in those studies, they adjusted lysine, so it might be that lysine just does, doesn't work that way. Um, my So my recommendation would be if you are having, especially with gut pathogens, because I think maybe we could at least uh, put it to other enteric pathogens is that you might want to look at maybe increasing the methionine, the threonine, and the tryptophan content in the diet. And we're talking 20%, right? It, it's not really a lot when you consider some of the other things that are put in diets that you put in just in case that might cost a little bit more. Um, and part of my recommendation for this, and it also re relates back to the, the question that you said we were going to get back to is like, well, if I don't see an effect on performance, why would I put this in? So I'm, I'll, I'll mention two other studies that we've done where we looked at the long-term effects. And so in these studies, we use the same blend of amino functional amino acids. We put them in right at weaning. We fed the diets for four weeks. Then we adjusted the or, or we, we moved them all all the pigs onto a common grower diet for a week then we challenge them and then we follow them so by the time we're measuring them they've already been off the functional amino acids for at least a week before we challenge them yeah. right and now we're seeing well what did they have any effect in none of these studies did we show an improvement in growth performance or any other aspect during the nursery period while we were giving them, right? So everybody would be like, well, why would I put that up in my uh, uh, nursery diets? 
But when we challenged them and we looked at their growth performance, the growth performance of the pigs that had received functional amino acids was greater than the ones that hadn't in the nursery. And when wow. we looked at aspects wow. like the immune response uh, and, and gut health and stuff like that, right, where we did see that, you know, they are, it's better with the functional amino acid supplementation beforehand, right? So it's not even that you're looking for it at the time, but especially in that early period, you are also uh, potentially setting them up for success later because you're also providing what is needed for that proper gut development and, and immune response development. You know, that's, that's very interesting, uh, Dan. Uh, and you're not the only person who is kind of talking in those terms about how we manage uh, feed and manage pigs in that period immediately post weaning and the effect that that has on long-term performance. And of course, I'm referring to Adam Moser's work at Michigan State. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that's what really captured my attention. That's now getting to be relatively old data uh, in, in the world of science, but it, it seemed so foundational and, uh, and really told me that when we're formulating diets and evaluating management practices for the, that first two to three weeks after weaning, um, just looking at growth performance really is not enough for us to draw conclusions on what is the optimum program. And it looks like you've got data that would support that as well. Yeah. And one of the things that actually got us thinking about this was it, it was actually a study that was done with uh, Case DeLang. I was still there at the time and they were starting to look at uh, simple versus complex diets. So basically plant-based, no antibiotics with animals and potentially animal uh, or, or animal-based products and potentially antibiotics included because they wanted to know, is there an effect on performance or are you okay? You know, and they found out that oh yeah, you can feed the simple diet. They don't do as well in the nursery, but they catch up and all the pigs were fine at the end of market. And in that study, in one of the blocks, they actually had a disease challenge go through. I, I think it was erysipelas or something like that, that went through. And so kind of anecdotally, they, they saw that the pigs that had been on the complex diet had, not, uh, had done better during that challenge than the ones that wow. had been on the simple diet. But then there was never any follow-up to be like, mm. okay, what, what's right? It, it was it the diet or, or what's going on. So that was one of the things that we wanted to start to look at is like, okay, maybe the simple diets are okay if you focus on growth, but maybe long-term you're going to run into problems or you're going to set your pigs up. And it, we actually did one of our studies where we looked at simple versus complex. So we either was all plant-based or we included animal-based proteins. Uh, this was one of the long term where we fed that throughout the nursery and then we switched them and, and challenged them. And the pigs that had received the animal based proteins did better in that subsequent challenge than the ones that, that had received the plant based protein uh, only diet. So this is one of those. Uh, this is a very clear take home, I think, for the people is that when you are looking at switching to, say, all plant based or removing your animal based proteins, which I know a lot of RWA programs, you know, they also require limited animal based diets that you may have to really step up management, uh, health, you know, uh, disinfection of those rooms and monitoring those pigs because you, they might not be set up as well if you have a challenge or a stressful time later on just because they were on that simple diet. Okay, very, very good. It's time for our famous three. Well, it's time for us to turn to the three questions, Dan, if you don't mind. <laughs> sure. And uh, you're well aware of them. So the first one is, what is your favorite uh, swine-related book? So for me, I, I think it's probably going to be a, an obvious one, but a big go-to for me would be NRC, just because you know it's 10, 11 years old now, but I think it's still very relevant. Uh, and provides a lot of information in there. I also, because of my focus on amino acids, really like the the amino acid books by uh, Gu Yao Wu, who you know is probably the amino acid guy to go to, and so it's always beneficial. He's he's one of the ones that coined the the term functional amino acids, right? So he's kind of yep. my go to. Very good. And what about books of any kind, uh, fiction, nonfiction, not related to swine? <laughs> I'll, I'll give two because I, I, I do like reading a lot of fiction to get 
you know, it lets me escape, but I also do read a lot of self-help or, or books too. So with fiction, I think anything by Stephen King and particularly this Dark Tower uh, books are my favorite. I've read through the series three times now, uh, and it's it's always interesting to read. Um, the other one that I like is more on the self-help. Uh, it's a couple years old now, but it was big as um, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F uh, by Mark uh, Manson. Uh, which kind of, you know, it's kind of a guide to life and how we should be looking at things. And But I particularly like that one because he challenges a lot of the the, conce- the, the ideas that are being put out there right now, right? He, he has no problem coming out and saying, you're not that special. You don't deserve happiness. You don't, you know, and, and, and the, but the way he writes it, it, you know, it makes sense. Yes. You know, yes. and the biggest thing, the biggest message that I think he puts in there is that if you're happy, you're not growing and you only get growth by struggle. Right. And so that's where we really need to focus on. Right. <laughs> on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> so, struggle is good. It's whether yeah. or not you decide to suffer. That is yeah. that is up to you. Right. <laughs> there you go. That kind of follows the same line of thinking, I guess, is that I've learned more from my mistakes than from my successes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Same kind of logic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the, the final question is, is Dan, oh, you've been at Prairie Spine Center for eight or nine years. You've, you've got considerable experience. You've met lots of people, seen lots of people um, out in the swine world. What is it that sets apart those who have achieved particular success? in the swine world what what how, what makes them successful yeah for for me and this might be a little bit self-serving because i i do consider myself to be one of these but i i particularly enjoy working with and seeing the people that are the disruptors they're they're willing to go in and challenge dogma and question you know whether something is actually the way it is or we should be doing it the way that we should and they're not afraid to speak that and and to question it and to look into it, right? And then on the other side of it is admit when they're wrong. Right. You know, I, I think that's the biggest thing. We don't get anywhere. We don't grow unless we're willing to challenge uh, a, a, and to ask the, the difficult questions. Right. Ask the difficult questions and be willing to accept the answer. Dr. Dan (laughs) Columbus, thank you so very much. This has been a really interesting podcast, and we really appreciate you taking time to spend uh, with us today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. The journey of a hero has challenges, battles, and villains. But after the fight is won, New paths are open, and it's time to catch our breath and move forward. More powerful and super than ever. And you, hero of the swine industry, do you have your cape ready to take new flights? Swine Talks 2023, December 6th and 7th. Together, we're more super than any obstacle.